Hi, I'm Sam Kaufman, and I run a school called The Human Path, and I've co-founded a nonprofit called Herbal Medics, a nonprofit that goes around and uh, provides herbal health care for people who are medically underserved, as well as a lot of other things. And uh, I'm here to talk about a few plants today here on our property at the school. We have a 50-acre campus here, and we have a lot of medicine growing on the, on, the, on the campus. And one of my favorites is right here to my left, which is uh, uh, Xanthus Island. It's a prickly ash. It's one of the xanthoxylum species, I believe this is hirsutum, and it is uh, in, the, in the citrus family, and it is an amazing medicine in many, many ways. On this particular species, the leaf actually is, is usable. It's very, very potent. If you take the, the leaf and put it in your mouth, you'll feel, you know, another name for this plant is tickle tongue, and you'll feel why. It starts to, it, it, you'll get that kind of that numb, that buzz feeling on your, on your tongue. Uh, similar to maybe how echinacea feels, but a little more potent. If you rub it on your gum long enough, for about five minutes or so, you'll start to kind of numb the feeling in that area. So if you have a toothache, it's also called toothache tree. Uh, it's also called, uh, the club of Hercules species is called the Hercules club. So there's got a lot of different common names. But uh, I use the leaf, I use the bark, I use the berry, and I use probably the most potent part, if you happen to luck out on one that's being dug up anyway, is the bark of the root. Not the root, necessarily, but the bark of the root, which in some, uh, as it gets older, can be very, very thick, and that's extremely strong. And so what I normally do is I harvest this fresh, but I don't have to. You can certainly dry it. You can harvest it and then dry it and then tincture it from there. So I do one of two things. I'll either harvest, harvest it fresh, and I will sometimes mix the root and the bark, or the root bark, and, the, and if I'm lucky enough to get some, and the bark and the leaf and the berry all together. I'll put them all together. Put in a blender, mix it up, and just do a maceration, a fresh maceration, simple, you know, basically a tincture out of that. You can do that. Um, other times I will harvest it and I'll dry it. Usually I use, I would say more than anything, I probably use the bark. Uh, I know in, uh, in Chinese medicine, the, the berry is used, uh, and it's used in a little different way a lot of times than the bark. It's actually used as a culinary spice as well. But I like to put them all together, or I prefer, if I just had to use only one thing, and I couldn't choose anything else, and I had, and I wanted to keep the tree alive, of course, if I can, then it would be the bark that I would choose. So I'll take the bark and I'll dry that, and then what I'll usually do with that is grind that into a powder, and I like to percolation tincture that. So I'll percolate that, usually anywhere between about 40 to 60 percent alcohol. Anywhere in there is pretty good. There's a lot of water-soluble constituents in here. There are a lot of alcohol-soluble constituents in here works extremely well. I, there's even stuff you can put it into oils. I use it in oils as well. So if you're going to make a salve out of it, you can think of it as what I'll talk about in a second. It's a great carrier herb, right? So it does probably its biggest uh, uh, benefit that most people are aware of is that it is a peripheral vasodilator. So it's, it really heats up your blood. So it gets, it gets your blood moving. It also moves the lymph, in my opinion. Uh, it also moves the respiratory tract a little bit. It even moves the digestive tract a little bit. We find that herbs that are movers tend to be herbs that help pull us back into health a lot of times. They're herbs that shift us into health uh, kind of from that old stanza that you'll hear, uh, the saying that you'll hear in, in emergency medicine, they'll say, the solution to pollution is dilution. Sort of that same concept applies to our body. If we have stagnancy anywhere in our body, we tend to get dis-ease or dis-health. And if we can get movement going, that's when we start to pull ourselves back into health. So whether it's in a formula with other herbs that are more uh, you know, antibacterial, for instance, or antimicrobial, or uh, might be for just uh, wound and tissue healing, for instance. They might be more uh, anti-inflammatory. Whatever it is, it's amongst other things, it is a really good mover. So it, it gets that the blood moving. I had a, um, a student in one of my survival classes who, at one in the morning, they were out doing, a, you know, their the scenario, and it was it had been raining for three weeks. It was cold. It was probably 40, 45 degrees. He was soaked to the bone. He was getting sick, and he was just chilled. He was shaking uncontrollably, like almost in, you know, moderate stage of hypothermia. He wasn't really hypothermic. He was just he was shivering because he was sick and he was wet and he was cold. So I went out and told him, hey, you know, you're done. Come on, get you back to your tent and let's let's get you warmed up and everything. So we got him back to his tent, and I happened to have some prickly ash tincture in my pocket. 
which sometimes I do, <laughs> and it was just prickly ass tincture, nothing else, right? And I had it, and I carry them in these Nalgene bottles when we for our first aid kits. That's what I usually use. And so I took a capful and I said, here, just take a capful of this. I'm going to go get some other herbs too, because I wanted to. You know, he was very much into herb, using herbs. I always ask my students first. He was very much into using that, and uh, wanted to get him uh, obviously dried out, warmed up, and you know, into a sleeping bag. So I said, okay, so take your wet clothes off, get dried up, and get in your sleeping bag. And uh, so I'll be back in about five minutes. So I come back, it was actually more like 10 minutes, and I've got some other herbs, and I was just ready to check on him, and he's still sitting in his tent. He's got his shirt off now, but he's not, and he's, and he's completely dry. He's not only is he dry, but he's got steam just like pouring off of him, and he's like sweating, and he's going, whew, man, oh my God, what, what's in that stuff, right? <laughs> it just, boom, it just heats you up really, really well. Uh, you know, so, so this is, you know, for people that maybe have a lack of um, circulating circulation problems, you know, even, um, even issues where the, maybe it's, uh, uh, you know, old, old, older people tend to tend to be that way sometimes, right? So even taking a bath in it will work for something like that. It's sort of like yarrow in that regard. This is that diaphoretic. I think diaphoretic is, is not really a good term uh, for for herbs because it's just kind of a single concept. What I like to say is it's a skin eliminative. In other words, it opens that skin elimination channel really, really well. Uh, so that's that's one of its main uses. I also use it uh, that way, as I said, in salves for like sprain and strain type salves, where we want to try to get. Other herbs, like the one growing right next to it, the juniper berry, great for that too, and really good as an anti-inflammatory and just, uh, you know, helping with that aspect of healing from the inflammation stage to the proliferation stage. It tends to be able to move things that way too, moving the blood in the area. So when we have a lot of inflammation from, let's say, a, you know, a dislocation or a sprain or whatever it might be, we've got all of that fluid that's, that's in that area that we need to, you know, we need to, to get it out, right, at some point. And there's a lot involved in that. There is cytokine signaling from our macrophages and from white blood cells that are in there. There is the whole concept of permeability, tissue permeability in there. And so what I find is that as we start to increase the circulation in the area with plants like this and with plants like yarrow, that what happens is it speeds up that, that next phase of healing, the proliferation phase. Uh, so I use it that way as well. So in a nutshell, um, I would say, you know, just to kind of give you the, the terms for it, I would say it's a, it's a diaphoretic, you want to use it as a diuretic, it's even a little bit, in my opinion, of a digestive, you know, bitter, it kind of moves the, the gut a little bit as well. Uh, it is a uh, tissue healer, it is a anti-infective, it is a lymph mover, so it's an, it's an immunomodulator, um, and it certainly is, I, I would say, you know, in the, in re, in regards to all the things I just said, that makes it kind of an antiviral, not from the standpoint of like, you know, the concept of like it's going to nuke vir a virus or anything like that, but just from the standpoint that it raises our own ability to deal with a viral infection so well, especially the common ones like colds and flus and that type of thing. To prepare it, like I said, you know, you can trim off, you can, you can when I try to, to harvest it, what I'll generally do is I'll harvest and, and uh, prune it, right? I, I love my prickly ash trees on the property. I would never, ever pull one out. Um, so I'll prune it uh, in a way to hopefully milk, make it grow a little better uh, and then I'll uh, scrape off that bark and I just take, honestly, even though we're getting the inner bark, the outer bark is so thin, I just take everything off. Just take everything off the wood, put that into your fresh tincture, put some leaf in there with it, put some berry in there with it. If you have the root bark, if you have that too. I'm a big fan of using the whole plant whenever we can. I think that a lot of that kind of information, that, that, uh, that herbal knowledge has been kind of lost over the years and we tend to think of plants very kind of uh, in sort of a one-dimensional sense instead of putting everything together. I'll use it in cold and flu formulas with things like yarrow and bone set and elderflower or elderberry even. Um, that's, that's one of my big favorites too. I'll use it in sprain and strain formulas with things like arnica or from here we have the, um, the camphor weed, you know, that I use kind of, it's called Mexican arnica, it's not, you know, it's the, um, the um, heterotheca uh, um, subaxillaris, I think is what it is. Uh, I will use it in the formulas I talked about there, probably about one half the amount as I would use with some of the more mild. So in that lymph formula, for instance, I'd probably put one part poke, one part xanthoxylum or prickly ash, and then maybe two parts of everything else that I mentioned there would be a pretty good you know, moderate lymph mover that you wouldn't have to worry so much about. If I really want to, if there's really a reason uh, to, to move the lymph strongly, I, I would up the dosage of it though. Uh, I rarely ever use it as a simple per se, uh, but I will, like I'll chew on a, on, a, on a twig. That's another thing I didn't talk about is the twigs make great uh, tooth sticks, right? You can also put it into tooth powders. Um, you can use it in gum poultices. You can use it for, I love to use it for mouth infection stuff. So for something like that, 
I would probably do it, uh, be much more inclined to use it even straight or much stronger in a formula to where we're putting it directly on, say, for something like an, a, a tooth, an impacted tooth or a, or a tooth in infection, something like that, where we had, uh, we usually need a lot more strength out of that. So that doesn't really answer your question real well. I would say I just, you know, in terms of dosage on anything for me, it always depends on the person, their size, their age, how sick they are and what I'm trying to affect. But this is one that I would say of very few plants are like this for me that I will dose it back just a little bit because it is so strong. And some people, especially with the root uh, tincture, I've had people take just a few drops of the root tincture by itself because it'll be just like, hey, just check this out and see what you think of it. And I've had a few people that were like, oh my God, you know, they thought they were having, having a, a anaphylactic re reaction to it, you know, because they think that their airway is swelling because it numbs their tongue completely. It's not swelling and they're not having it, but they think they are. So it's that strong. It can really numb your, your tongue. But it generally likes a lot of sun, but the thing is you find it as a substory because of the fact that the only way I'm convinced to easily grow this plant is to pass it through the digestive tract of a bird. So what you find is, you know, wherever birds roost along fence posts, and you'll find a lot of ranchers in the, you know, especially in Texas, that have it growing everywhere. And they'll actually go out and they'll pull it out when they're pulling out a fence line. If you can do that and you're lucky enough to see somebody doing that, then you can go and harvest the root if it's gonna be pulled out anyway. Um, so it's kind of like that. So you see it growing alongside juniper out here a lot, uh, and that's probably not because it grows so well next to it, but it can. It's probably more because of, uh, of the birds and the birds, you know, especially the cardinals, I think, eat the, like the berries, and they go and they roost around in the juniper, and it grows out there.